Good morning. How are you doing? Have you enjoyed the conference? Yes. Great, great. What a great group of people. How many of you were here on Friday? All of you. Oh, great, great. So I don't have to start over again. Um, you know, I, I have had, as I said on Friday, the, the privilege of coming to know and traveling with, um, as my dad likes to call them, the dead guys, uh, people who went to the other side and and came back. And, and I really think of these people as angels among us, really, because uh, there was a saying that used to be said that death was that mysterious country or that that mysterious journey from which no traveler returned to tell the tale. Well, they have. And we have a road map, uh, so to speak, from these experiences that people have had. They have illumined, you know, one of the greatest fears that we in the Western world have had. Um, you know, in, in the East, however, uh, there were people like uh, M. Night Shyamalan, the film director who did The Sixth Sense, uh, he was born in India, and that movie, you know, in an interview that I saw with him, he said, you know, I grew up uh, with the idea of, of knowing that because you depart the physical body, you know, the, the soul continues to live on. And he said, and that understanding came when I heard this noise upstairs and asked my mother what that was, and she said, oh, it's your grandmother. And he's like, but grandma's dead. It's like, yeah, she's just moving on. You know, very similar, you know, he said, and I was a little kid, and I'm hearing these noises upstairs. My mom's saying, it's okay, she's just finishing up some of the last details. And so that really gave birth to this amazing film. How many of you saw The, the Sixth Sense? Yeah, and see, when I wrote the book, The Place We Call Home, uh, I had read certain readings uh, where Casey had said that some souls remain uh, n not trapped so much, but they're on the other side. And the change at death is so, su is so subtle that, uh, he said, many don't realize for some time that anything has even changed. They just don't understand why you and I aren't acknowledging them. Or it's like there's something wrong with them. They've gone deaf. They can't hear a word I'm saying. And then usually there'll be a guide or somebody that comes, that's, and it's usually someone who's passed on. And they'll go, where'd you come from? He's like, dearie, um, I got a little news for you. Um, you're, what the, you're what the earth calls dead. And they're like, right. Because the etheric body, uh, what we move into, we leave the physical body, looks just like this one. You know, and in that fourth dimensional realm, uh, you know, we're not some ghostly apparition. I mean, to them, they look exactly the way they looked when they departed, only they're free from pain. They went back to age 30 or 25. Um, and so, you know, these, no matter what the circumstances are, you know, regardless of whether the death is traumatic uh, or sudden, there is a period of rest prior to uh, the awakening, Edgar Cayce said, most souls gradually become aware of being in the fourth dimension after the passage. And they wake up in the companionship of friends, loved ones, and whatnot, and realize that that's where we came from. You know, we came from there originally. We go there at night, according to Edgar Cayce, when we go to sleep every night. You know, in that sleep state, because you've all had dreams of people that you've known and loved. How many of you have had dreams of people who have passed on? Right. It's, it's like, so of all the people that I have met who have had these near-death experience or after-death encounters through dream states, I don't remember any of them saying it was totally bizarre. What was bizarre was how comfortable they felt after the passage. And so, there are these transitional stages where the soul, after the, the journey, after death, you know, that for such a long time we have held on to the vision of what they looked like before they passed, the circumstances, you know, under which they, um, that, that caused their death. And a lot of us, you know, are deeply hurt, you know, by 
what happened to them. And I remember this woman who was, took care of her mother back in the 50s, and she died of breast cancer. And it was not an easy transition. It was very, very difficult, very painful. And she, she couldn't get out of her mind what her mother went through. You know, she just kept replaying this over and over because, you know, it's, it's hard to witness somebody going through this. So she has this dream with her mother, and she looked radiant, she looked young, and the woman knew that she was dreaming, and she said, Mom, what are you doing here? And she said, Dearie, what are you doing here? <laughs> exactly. In the sleep state, that's the bridge, that's that place where we can meet again. And the first thing the daughter said was, oh, Mom, I, I, you look great. She said, well, I feel fabulous. She said, but the way you went, I mean, the cancer. And, and the mother looked perplexed. She's like, hmm? She said, the, the cancer, remember, Mom, the, you know, you went out really hard. And she said, oh, that, oh, um, I really don't remember the details, dearie. All I remember is the love. All I remember is the love. Isn't that beautiful? So the, she called me and she said, the months and years I spent, you know, agonizing over this, and my mother's talking about it like, oh, that. You know, I really came to, I've come to understand that we don't remember that painful passing any more than we remember our painful birth. And Edgar Cayce said, it is much easier to leave this world than it is to enter into it. And when you think about it, what would it be like if we could remember our birth? Oh, geez. I mean, I was breech. I was, you know, my mom was in labor for 108 days. Uh, no, uh, everything that could have gone wrong at my birth did. And, uh, and yet, I don't have any memory of that. The readings say very clearly, they say, when does the soul enter the body? And he said, at first breath or up to some weeks after. Now, that's interesting. And they said, well, if it's some days or hours or weeks later, what keeps the body alive? And he said, spirit. He said, what keeps you alive when you're sleeping? He said, you're not in the body when you're sleeping. There's that cord, that connection that connects to the astral or the etheric body. And so while uh, during the pregnancy, the, the soul can be around the family, but it is not inside the mother. It's not until it is a separate uh, breathing entity that the soul enters in. And even then, it's a gradual process of incarnation. And so um, there were people who came to Edgar Cayce whose children had passed on before them. And um, there's nothing harder in this world than for a parent to have to say farewell to their children. My mom used to say it just goes against nature, you know, to go through that experience. And so I was just so relieved when I, as I was part of that computerization project, when I'd read these readings and the mother would say, you know, my son that, that died at age four, um, what did I do wrong? And he said, uh, that soul only needed to be near the parents for a short time. He said, but in that short time that that soul was here, it experienced all the love that may be experienced in an entire lifetime. He said, and then chose to return home to its maker. So as hard as it is for us, you know, when we examine those readings, you know, whether it's a day, a month, two years, you know, that soul um, will always be connected to you in, in some way. And Edgar and Gertrude Casey had a son, Milton Porter Casey, who died. I don't know how many of you knew that uh, at age two. And it was devastating for the Caseys. And they had to go through all the stages that, that we go through with um, the grief and, and 
things like that. 11 years later, Casey gave a life reading for this woman's son. And when he gave the previous incarnation, it was Milton Porter Casey. And Edgar Casey got to know this child before he passed on. And so life, in its essence, is continuous. And so for those people, I never saw one reading where Casey said uh, that the parents had done something wrong that led to the child's passing. I'm talking about sudden infant death syndrome or crib death or you know, things of that matter. Um, he said that the soul withdrew its opportunity for its own purposes, for its own reasons. And he said, and yet they carry that love with them to the other side. And he said, such experiences are hard to be understood by the material minded. And when he says the material minded, what he's talking about are, you know, us, you know, thinking that if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. He said, and yet through these experiences, it can lead to a spiritual awakening for the parents. You know, out of that darkness can come light. You know, it usually leads to a search. And that search usually leads them to someone or some experience that lets them know that this is not it. This is just a small portion of a much, much bigger picture. And so this morning I'm going to talk about um, some of the dimensions of the afterlife and I'm going to lead you through a guided meditation. And the purpose of that is that what Edgar Cayce said that our minds can attune to those infinite unseen realms where he said all is in a state of atonement. He said, through the avenues of the imagination and the intuition, he said, ye may know that all is well. And so uh, we'll do that later on this morning. And it really is, uh, you don't have to be anything but open to have this experience. And so uh, I actually came to understand that through the avenue of the imagination and the intuition, that's where there's the bridge to the unseen realms. I was working with a woman in hospice and uh, she was, she had terminal cancer and so I would lead her through these guided meditations, mainly for pain relief and just to help her feel better. But in the back of my mind I was, I was telling her about the light. Even though we'd never discussed these things, I'd say that there's a beautiful light that surrounds you. Well, in the middle of one of these relaxation sessions at the time that I called it, she said, I saw a tear come out of her eye. And I said, Ruth, what are you seeing? And she said, I'm seeing two friends that I knew in high school who both died from cancer. She said, and they look radiant. She said, and they're holding their arms out to me. Like, I know they'll be there when I cross over. Now, for me at that time, that was... A revelation and I realized that when we get into that relaxed state that there wasn't just relaxation going on but there's that open door God's other door as Casey called it where we can know that that all truly is well um, someone was asking Edgar Casey about you know the dimensions of the afterlife and uh, actually, they were talking to him in a letter, and they said, you know, the one thing that bothers me is I love books so much. You know, I love reading, and I just can't imagine a world, seen or unseen, without them. And Casey said, well, there isn't any world without books. They, they all have books. And so in this reading, someone said, are there literally books? He said, do you have books in the earth? I'm like, yes. It's like he said, those are shadows or reflections of books from the other side. Shadows. And in talking to Dr. George Ritchie, as, who I mentioned on Friday, who had this profound near-death experience uh, as a result of pneumonia, and he was dead for at least 10 minutes, uh, long enough for them to fill out the death certificate, one of the realms that he saw, and uh, for those of you who don't know, George... Richie wrote a book called Return from Tomorrow, and uh, he just passed on this past year, for good, I might add. Um, 
but his death came at age 20, and it profoundly affected and inspired my, my own life because unlike a lot of other people's, he didn't have the tunnel experience. Like he, uh, he was in the presence of this wondrous light that, that he identified as Christ. And, um, and I've said this at other programs, and many of you have heard it before, but he said, it loved every unlovable thing about me. It loved, you know, the love was a given. It was a fact. You know, I had to look at what I had done and what I had not done um, from my vantage point. But he said, but the love never wavered. Well, he journeyed through many different dimensions from the most earthbound to the most heavenly. And in between there, he said, I don't know where this place was, but it was a realm that, he said, it looked like a giant university. He said, the, he said picture the size of Los Angeles as a library. He said, and there were souls from all over the universe who had come here that were learning about God. And he said, he said, and I mean this literally, souls from all over the universe, not just from the earth. He wasn't talking about aliens. He was talking about, you know, beings that he said, I don't know much about them, but I could, I just recognized that they were from another place. But he said, but you could feel that everybody was aware that we came from the one source. He said, there is no chaos in that realm. There's no disharmony because we're all aware of this sense of oneness, and yet everybody has their individuality. And he said, all of the sacred books that have ever been written, he said, in our world, he said, could fit on one wall of this vast university. He said, there were millions of books, you know, that uh, he said, that I know nothing about, but there were teachers, there were people that were studying. He said, and the atmosphere was just absolutely vibrant and joyous. You know how you feel when you read a great book? Multiply that times a thousand, and you get some glimpse of what it will be like to, to go. And, you know, my home is decorated in modern book and plant. You know, I've, it's, you know, I love uh, books. And so, but what was interesting was there was this one area where this, these books were cordoned off. You know, it had like kind of this velvet kind of a rope. You know, it wasn't, you know, restricted, but it was, he could tell that there was something different about them. And when he asked the librarian what, what those books were, she said, oh, those are books that haven't been written on earth yet. She said, we have to be very careful as to who, looks at those. So what it is, is the receptive minds here on earth, you know, when we tune in, whether it's writing, art, music, mechanics, engineering, we're drawing from those uh, realms in spirit where the source of music, the source of writing, that's the source. This is the result. And I thought that is absolutely amazing because you know, any of you who have um, been involved in a creative endeavor, whether it's painting, sculpting, writing, uh, filming, that there's a moment where you get into this zone, you know? I call it the God zone, for lack of a better word. And there's this, this flow where the information just comes through. That, that, is, that feeling that you get is that literally we are like vessels that are channeling this information from these higher realms. And uh, when I looked at George's experience, then it made a lot more sense to me what Edgar Cayce said, that the Earth is only an atom in the universe of worlds. But this is just a small portion of the greater reality. And there is a, a book that I don't know whether it's in print or not, but it's called Life in the in the world unseen, and uh, you may be able to find a copy. It was originally published in the 1800s, and it's by Anthony Borga, B-O-R-G-I-A, but if you look up Life in the Unseen World, what's interesting about this book is that um, it was written by a former Baptist minister who had, or I should say, it came from a former Baptist minister who had passed on 
and he tuned into someone who was gifted, like uh, Robert Brown or uh, you know a number of, of great mediums. And it says here that um, Robert Hughes Benson was a clergyman with a flair for writing books. And when he died in 1914, he came to the startling realization that most of what he had written was, in fact, totally false. Coming from his Baptist uh, or fundamentalist Christian background, you went to one of two places, heaven or hell. And most people are going to hell, you know. And, and, uh, and so his quest was then to correct the misconceptions he had brought on mankind. And with the approval of those who presided over him, Robert was given another chance to dictate another book. And this he did through a very close friend. And so when he describes the same place that, that Dr. Ritchie saw, this vast library, I'd, I'd like to read this to you. Um, And the book is falling apart, so please uh, bear with me just, just a moment here. Um, first of all, he described the geographical position of, and I know that sounds strange because we're talking about fourth dimensional realities here, but he's talking about the geographical position or where these unseen realms are located. Well, uh, his explanation really shed a lot of light on that just as we have different nations, different groups in different places, there are similar places, dimensions on the other side. He said, what is the geographical location or position of the spirit world in relation to the earth world? Many people have wondered at different times and myself among the many. And this leads to a further question concerning other realms. He said, but I can narrow things down a little by telling you that, uh, he said, all of the dimensions are arranged in concentric circles with the earth at the center and these other realms radiating outward. And he said, I have told you how when I reached a critical point as I lay upon my bed of earthly sickness, I at length felt an irresistible urge to rise up and that I yielded to that urge easily and successfully. And in this particular case, the line of demarcation was very fine between my earthly life and the spirit, the spirit realm. And he said, since that day, I have learned many things. And one of my first lessons was in the art of personal locomotion by other means than walking. And uh, Dr. Ritchie, when he found himself on the other side, you know, he was walking and he'd think, oh, well, I got to get to this place. And because he desired it, he found himself there. And so this is, this is usually the point where people wake up to, oh, I'm in a different dimension. Uh, he said, there are immense distances here to cover, and sometimes we need to cover them instantly. We do so by the power of thought. But the strangest thing to me at first was the fact that when I moved myself through space, at any greater speed than ordinary walking, I found that I had no sense of absolute direction, but one of movement only. If I chose to close my eyes while traveling with moderate speed, I simply realized that there was no traveling. I was simply in one place and in another in an instant. This absence of a sense of direction in no way interferes with our initial thought function in personal movement. Once we have determined to journey to a certain place, we set our thoughts in motion and they instantaneously set our bodies into motion. He said, one must almost say it requires no thinking about. It's kind of like, remember the series Bewitched? Mm -hmm. Kind of like that. You know, they, they're here and they're there. It's hard for us to conceive of those things because we were in a three-dimensional realm where we have to, we're aware of traveling a distance. So you can see that after leaving this realm behind that there's a great deal of delight and joy at, you know, remembering, you know, how we truly do move. And he said, the spirit world is divided into spheres or realms. These two worlds, 
the words of designation have passed into current uh, exception among most of those on the earth plane who have knowledge of and practice uh, with communication with our world. In speaking to you thus, I have used these words, but they are only a mere reflection of the great beauty of these many, many dimensions. He said, the spheres of the spirit world are arranged in a series of bands forming of concentric circles around the earth. These circles reach out into infinity. And in each realm, it's a different vibration. It's like it's a different place. Like one may be of, um, like I said, art or music or science. But they're, just as we have individual homes here, and individuals, that's how many worlds there are. I mean, it it's just boggles the imagination. And he said, and these realms are invisibly linked with the earth world in its lesser revolution. Uh, there are lower realms of darkness which are situated close to the earth plane and interpenetrated at its lowest. It was through these that I first passed with Edwin when he came to take me to the spirit realm. Um, in talking about these, these realms, uh, first of all, this is why so many people, when they have a near-death experience, there is a tunnel. So they don't see the more earthbound realms of consciousness. Now, we might look at those realms as where our, the person's material desires have outweighed their spiritual beliefs. Uh, you know, the Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, what is that treasure? Well, it's what you've, you've built, what you've created. And so, you know, if it's been purely of a material making, there are souls that find themselves attached to the earth. You know, they see their friends and uh, long for, you know, to be back into the earth. Meanwhile, there are their guardians or their angels that are waiting for them to let go of their attachments. And, you know, we all know people who live like that here, don't we? Right. Well, again, as, as above, so below. And so it's not that these souls have been cast out of the light. They, by their own choosing, have chosen to reside in these more lower or astral realms. And some of them get caught because in the lower realms, whatever you think, whatever you dwell upon, immediately is manifested before you. So you can imagine for some souls that have been very material-minded what that could be like. You know, if whatever you thought about was manifest immediately. So many of them get mesmerized by the thoughts around them. Uh, this is a transitional period. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the book, The Boy Who Saw True, this, the boy who was consciously psychic at 10 years old and didn't know there was no difference between the worlds. And his grandfather was happily going uh, to this university of God, and he was going and listening to these amazing concerts. And there was one composer that he said that wrote like 12 symphonies. I don't remember the name of him, but he said, I went to go hear his 13th symphony. So the great composers, the great musicians, you know, continue to compose in these higher realms. And so whatever has been your passion, whatever has been your love, that you will move into, but at a much more expansive way and in harmony with other people who feel and think just like you do, exactly like you do. And so from that standpoint, you know, it really, if we follow what we love, know that when we shed the body, we go to the source of that which we loved, that which we love to do, whether it was art, music, painting, whatnot. Um, absolutely amazing. And George Ritchie, you know, after being shown this wonderful library, he was taken, he said, to a realm of science that is beyond words. He said, you know, he said, I'm speaking as an MD. This was George Ritchie. He said, as an MD, as a psychiatrist, a scientist, he said, I can tell you this realm that I saw was so technologically advanced that I cannot describe all the things that I saw. And everything that was there 
was eventually going to help humanity, technology-wise. He said whenever um, humanity was ready for like the next step or the next breakthrough in medicine or science or whatnot, these people who had been doctors and scientists and engineers, they would uh, put through this information into the collective subconscious of mankind, and then they would watch for the receptive minds to pick it up. And this explains why when a uh, paper is published, you know, on some scientific breakthrough, you know, there'll be one published in Japan, Sweden, America, Germany, simultaneously. And what does everybody do? They're trying to figure out who stole the idea from who, right? Well, it's hard for them to fathom that nobody stole it from anybody. That even Thomas Edison said, all ideas come from space or come from the infinite realms. But you can look back, I mean, just through the scientific journals and see so-and-so wrote a similar thing on the same day these things were published. And I think, you know, I can just see them laughing on the other side that they got it, you know. They're not concerned with their fighting over who, who got the idea first. Uh, as George Ritchie said, in the realm of spirit, there is no copyright. <laughs> I always like that. So what I'm saying is behind the scenes, there is this vast intelligence, uh, a divine intelligence, a loving one that if we open ourselves to it, as we open ourselves to it, more can come through us to help us in our individual lives and also help one another. It's like the greatest teachers that have ever come to the earth, uh, Jesus, Buddha, um, Krishna, all of them acknowledged that of themselves they were nothing but the vessels for the divine, that they were channels. What was it Jesus said, I of myself can do nothing, but it is God that works through me. All of them realize that they, each individual is a human conduit for whatever it is. So rather than this idea that we're trying to get out of here, out of the earth, I have this feeling that we're at this time in history, we're incarnating. More of us is coming into the earth. Uh, it's kind of like what Jesus did in his life 2,000 years ago, he was trying to show us, to demonstrate that, yes, we live in a finite world, but it's not finite at all. It's like it just appears that way. And I have absolutely no doubt that when he walked on water, he was laughing all the way. It had to have been just a very funny moment for all of those, you know, who were on the boat going, it's a ghost, you know, and he's going, it's not a ghost, it's me. And I could see him going, but you're walking on water. It's like, yes. And Casey said because of that attunement that he had, he was able to change his body's vibrations to be in harmony with wherever he went. So if you can just picture that, that in that light, Casey said what we call the miraculous is science not yet, what science has not yet discovered, but these are scientific principles. And so if we look at that idea that more of us is coming into the earth at this time, that more of our soul, more of our spirit is coming to the conscious mind, that makes it a little bit easier than thinking, I've come to the earth, I've got to pay off my karmic credit card at 32%. <laughs> oh, God, what have I done to do this? You know, um, it's perception. It's a matter of perception. How about the idea that we have come here to bring God fully into three dimensions? Fully. Like we've come to bring the fourth dimension into three-dimensional reality. Or in other words, to bring the infinite into a finite world. And hence, all the, what we thought were limitations are not limitations at all. And so, uh, Back to the story about this, the boy who saw true. When he would see his dead grandfather, you know, he asked, I know some of you have heard this before, but it, it does bear repeating. It talks about how our thoughts and our desires build 
the place or the realm that we pass to in the afterlife, immediately after death. And he said, how come gra grandmother doesn't come to see me? And he said, well, your grandmother thought, like a lot of people, that only she and a handful of souls were going to be saved. And she thought that she would be singing hymns around a throne of God forever and ever. And so the boy said, so where is she? He said, she's in a realm with people who believe just like she does, and there she's singing hymns around this throne. And this 10-year-old kid, and he chronicled all this in his diaries. It's absolutely, it's both amusing and sobering. He said, but Grandpa, why don't you go and tell her there's so much more? He said, I can't. He said, you have to realize, my boy, they're self-satisfied with where they are. They think that they're the only ones who have been saved. So if I show up, where do you think they think I came from? <laughs> right. I can see him going, yeah. be gone, demon, go back to, right. And so the boy, naturally concerned about his grandmother, said, well, how long will she stay there? He said, till she gets tired of it. Until she starts looking around for something else. Sound familiar? Sounds like here, doesn't it? Exactly. So I can picture the grandmother, you know, doing her thing, singing hymns around this throne. And after a while, the words start sliding off the page. You know, and the, or the throne starts to melt. And rather than being uh, disturbed, she's awed. And I can picture this little window opening up, and this window opens up, and she sees a light. And she's become very bored with singing hymns around a throne, and she's bored with all of these people that, that uh, she thought were the only ones that were saved, and she realizes that she's not exactly that fond of them anyway. And she moves through that window, and there's an angel waiting there, just exactly the way she pictured an angel should look, and it says, come with me. Lots to show you. And so that's where they move on. So no soul is stuck or trapped in any uh, system, you know, except by their own limited beliefs. And so that was something where, this is where I kind of part the ways with traditional fundamentalist Christianity, because George Ritchie saw realms of the lowest earthbound nature where people were bound by their desires, you know, and they wouldn't let go of them. And he said, and although we might say that they were, uh, their desires held them to the earth, they were never alone. That there, that there was a guardian angel or, or there was a spirit that was right there waiting for them to ask for help. And as soon as they did and they let go, then they, they went on. And so in, in that light, uh, it's like Edgar Cayce said, heaven is not a place that we go to, but it's a place we grow to on the arm of someone we have helped. It's a gradual process. It's a journey. And so in that light, you can see that as limited of beliefs that we hold or as expansive as our beliefs can be, you know, take thought of what you would like to see, where you would like to go after this earth is over. And as Casey said, as you imagine it, then it becomes your, your world, your reality. Um, and Edgar Casey said that whatever the soul needs to help it on its journey after the passage from this world, he said, uh, that is what is there to meet them. I'm reminded of this story of this woman who, she has a, a near-death experience and she sees this being of light and she, she asks, who are you? And the being says, well, some call me Buddha, some call me Christ. She says, well, I don't know Buddha. And the light says, then I'm Christ. <laughs> God doesn't have a problem with by whatever name that, that we recognize that which we look to, that uh, whether it's uh, Buddha or whether it's Jesus or whether it's Muhammad, by whatever name that we call it, uh, 
it's the one source. It manifests in a diversity of forms. And so it's not that there's some thought form that's waiting for us. The reading said, God is so mindful of each soul that God sends whatever we need at that point or that transition that we call death. Uh, it's always there. The health is always there. But a lot of times, not a lot of times, in some cases the soul, when it passes, is surrounded by all that it created in its life, you know, in the material world, and it chooses to rest for a period of time and reflect uh, on all that it went through in, in life. On the other side, they call this the, the halls of rest, and it's a place where after we pass on, sometimes whether the, the death was from as a result of cancer or whatnot, that they'll sleep for a period of time or they will rest. And it's a, a wonderful state of being. It's not uncomfortable. They're free from pain, but they're just resting until they decide to move on. As to how long, uh, Edgar Cayce said, some can stay in that sleep state for what you call years before they move on. But he said, realize there is no time. There is no space in, in those realms. What could be 10 years to us is a day to them. And so in the middle of this reading that Edgar Cayce was giving to someone, uh, totally unrelated to the subject of life after death, he said, well, this is interesting. Mr. Williamson, I'll call him, he said, uh, has been what you call dead for 10 years and just realized it. <laughs> then he went back to the reading. And it was like, and Hugh Lynn Casey was talking about this man in, in his lecture, and he said, I remembered that guy. He said he was in Selma, Alabama, and he was like the town miser. Like he was the one that just, you know, held on to, to everything. And he said, and he was not the kindest man in the world. Uh, he said, and I remember the night that he died because we could hear this screaming coming from the house next door. And he had bolted all the doors and wouldn't let anybody in. And finally the fire department broke through the doors and he had passed on. And so because he had been so materialistic, you know, when he passed on, you know, uh, Hugh Lynn said, there are realms where you'll see people doing nothing but counting money. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're counting money, you know, and there's other souls that are going, nothing costs anything. But again, <laughs> what they loved is right there, uh, you see. And so after a while, again, they get bored with it and they move on. But I found this interesting that Casey said it's been 10 years and he just woke up. And so there's always the opportunity to move to the next dimension. There is no permanent state of separation except what the soul wills. You know, by our own will, we separate ourselves. And I always, uh, I may, some of you may have heard me say this before, but I remember this woman asked me at a conference once, she said, okay, given all that you've said, what can I do to make sure that I gravitate to the highest realm possible after this life? <laughs> I'm going, what? You know, you're asking me? And she said, Yes, aren't you the expert? I said, no, I'm a bumbling student. I just happen to have written books and I'm speaking to you. And um, she said, well, what can I do? I'm thinking, you know those moments where you're like, what in the world am I going to say? And it comes. It came. And it was very simple. I said, what can you do to gravitate to the highest realm possible after this life is over? I said, mean well. She said, I'm sorry? I said, mean well. Move from the heart. So you move from the heart with compassion, with love, even to those who are not compassionate and loving. I said, it's not what we've done that determines where we go after we die or after we leave the body behind. It's what we feel in our heart, how much we've loved. That. So Casey was very clear. He said, just the trying to love a little bit more, you know, trying to show that love here and communicate that to those that we love, that is what builds the greater awareness after death. You know, again, the most profound spiritual truths are 
the most simple. And uh, so I'm just really glad that in, in this time, in, a, in our time, that the veil is being pulled aside, that we are seeing uh, many people who have come back who have had these profound near-death experiences. We have people like Robert Brown. And uh, yes, it is painful to have to say farewell to those that we love. But it's not a permanent goodbye. It's not. You know, uh, as I said on Friday, Casey said they're listening. They're listening for the voice of those they've known and loved in the earth to tell them that they love them, to tell them that it's OK to go on to the light. Um, we have this idea that we're holding them back. It's like, well, nothing in this world can truly hold a soul back. I mean. There are circumstances where, yes, we could make it easier on those that we love if, when we're by their deathbed, we tell them, there's a light right there. It's OK to go. Just let go. But if those things are not done, I saw in the readings where the soul vacates the body prior to the death actually happening. He said numerous times, we have the entity, not the body. The body just waits by here. And uh, how many of you have had the experience where you're with a family member, or you're with someone who's about to pass, and we have this 24-hour watch, you know, this, this deathbed vigil, and we go out for a cup of coffee. Everybody steps out of the room. How many of you know what I'm talking about here? Mm -hmm. And they go. And, the, and for some reason, we've been taught in the Western world that we're supposed to be there when they cross over. Having worked in hospice for over 20 years w with the terminally ill, I have never been in the room when they've actually made their transition. Never, not once. And so we get caught up in this idea that we're supposed to be there. No, we're not. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. But realize it's just a stepping off point. It's just leaving the body. And a lot of times, they've already departed. You can see that in their eyes. If you've been at the bedside of someone who is, who is in the process of their transition, you look into their eyes, and you can see they're not there. How many of you have had that experience? Right. It's, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing, because you know, for a long time, people thought, oh, gosh, they're, they're trapped in that body. Or worse than that, they're going to die. Well, you know, basic physics tells us that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It just changes its form. And so this is why it is so important for us, for our healing and for their healing, to say the things that you always long to say. Yes, it is easier if we can see them physically, but just because they've shed the body, the connection the, that connects us with all life is the love that we shared with them. That cannot be destroyed. It cannot go away. And so when people would come to Casey and say, I would like to talk to my mother. I'd like to talk to my brother or my daughter. He would say, this would best be approached from within. He said, turning within to meditation, you may know that all is well. You know." here and in the hereafter. When I read that reading, I thought he's telling them that when we shut out the outside world and go within, that's the bridge where we can feel that they're not gone from us. They may have moved on and they're about different activities, but the awareness, it's kind of like the way we have relatives here in the earth. You know, you have relatives, friends that live in different states, and you can pick up the telephone, right? Same thing. It's like. They're in different states, different countries, perhaps, but you know they're here. And so it's the same way. If we begin to look at it in that light, then we realize that they're not gone from us. They're not separate. And uh, we'll take a break in just a few minutes. Yes, sir, you had a question? Um, yeah, a couple. Um, so what you just said about what Casey's reading, and of course that was for one individual, about it would be better to go with them. He said it numerous times. Uh, his qu question was, he was saying that 
Kate. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so, so Casey's saying go within, and you're saying it, it kind of applied generally, but what Robert Brown does is so beautiful. Oh, it is. Would Casey recommend not, would he advise, it's not as good to do that? No, 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 I didn't mean that. It, it, he was, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean for that to be misconstrued. Uh, no, he, he did. Oh, I, I, he, pleh. I didn't mean that we shouldn't uh, go to gifted people like, like Robert Brown. No, I, not at all. Casey didn't say anything bad about that at all. He, he was just telling this person that everybody has, you know, that, that divine spark, that divine channel that, that they can. You know, it wasn't for this what, although it was for several people, you know, that was, yeah, for her. And for other people, they, like, uh, do you remember the, the medium Eileen Garrett? How many of you remember Eileen Garrett? She came, well, she was a very gifted medium in the 60s. She came to ARE, and her spirit guide, I cannot remember his name. Do you remember uh, his name? I, I don't. Um, anyway, she gave a reading for Casey, and he gave a reading for her. And absolutely... It was beautiful, and Eileen Garrett was able to do many, very similar to what Casey did in that her, her spirit guide, or control, we might say, was able to help people medically, spiritually, mentally, and uh, so they were very similar. And everything that she said in her reading for him was very, very accurate. The only thing was, was uh, the, the only difference was was in the reading that Eileen Garrett, what came through her, is his spirit guide offered to help Casey in the work that he was doing. And he was saying because, because he's not relying on one spiritual guide, he said, in essence, every time he gives a reading, he's giving a little part of himself away. Like, there's literally a part of his life that's uh, going out. It wasn't harming him, but he's saying, we could really help with this. And so Casey was open to this, so they asked in a reading, you know, would it uh, be wise to have this entity help in the work of Casey? And the answer was, is this entity, whatever its name was, greater than he who made him? It was like, oh. Uh, in other words, it was saying, uh, everything's okay. I mean, it was a very compassionate message that this spirit guide gave, but the, through the readings it was saying, Casey's being looked after. He's not, he's not being harmed. But uh, go ahead. Um, and, and then the other question was um, about uh, people who have a very difficult passing, and they, they need to sleep for what might be years on earth. Might that be a reason why some people who want to hear from a loved one can't hear for that number of earth years? Yes. Uh, he. What he asked was, for, during that period of sleep, were some souls sleep for a period of time, could that be why we don't hear from them uh, for a period of time? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in, in the readings on spirit communication, it uh, posed the question, it's like, why is the attunement not always right, or why can't we always see and communicate with those on the other side? And he said, he kind of turned the question around to the person who was asking, saying, do you have periods where you don't want to talk to anyone? He said, those on the other side have their moods. They have their, uh, they're going on about their work too. So there are times when there's the mutual desire for both to connect. That's when it happens. But it's like, and it's not that they don't want to speak to us. You have to realize that they're being instructed, they're moving on, you know, they're, and that doesn't mean that we've been forgotten, but it just means that they are, the way William James put it when he spoke through Jane Roberts, he said, think of going on a wonderful vacation to a, an exotic foreign country and you forget to send a postcard. He said, it's kind of like that. So in that light, it's not that, oh my gosh, they don't want to talk to me. It's like sometimes that the attunement isn't, isn't quite correct. Glennie. Rob, when, in, instead of saying that, you know, like, they're thinking that they go to sleep, they could also be in the university studying, right? 
that what Glennie just said, uh, yes, they could be in the university studying rather than, rather than sleeping. And so, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Yes? On the death of a child, do they transition and they're 30 years old, or do they grow up on the other side? Do they transition in their, uh, when, when a child passes on? Uh, are they 30 when they, when they make their transition? Uh, I don't know. I was making that observation because George Ritchie said, and other people said, everybody seemed to be in what they considered their prime. And children, uh, according to a number of different gifted mediums, have said they have a much easier time of it because they just came from there. They just, so the time they spent here was a moment. So they're acclimated more to the spiritual realm. And so they, does that make sense? Yes. Am I understanding correctly the following? If these souls are attached to the material world and, and it's only their will to move on, their desire to move on to a better realm, let's say, does that mean that we, as their loved ones, cannot help them come to that point, that they themselves have to come to that point? Uh, her question is, uh, those who say that they are earthbound or that they are attached to the earth by their desires, how can we help them? Right. Prayer. Uh, when we, uh, Ed Edgar Casey said, prayer for those who have made their transition uh, in whatever form that it takes, in whatever form that you pray, they hear that and it creates a light around them and helps them to, to move on. So, I mean, and according to the grandfather, who was talking to this boy in the, the boy who saw true, he said, uh, he said, the Protestants are quite incorrect about not praying for the dead. He said, uh, we should always pray for those over here. He said, because from my vantage point, he said, I can see it creates the most lovely light around them and lets them know they're not forgotten and helps them in ways I can't describe. So prayer in that light, yeah, I, again, that connection is there. So we can help them. And uh, we'll take a break and, and uh, I'll take one more question and then we'll take a break for about 20 minutes. Yes? Actually, I want to make a comment. You want to make a comment? Just a comment. Do we have a microphone? Okay. If we don't, that's okay. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I speak well, but, you know, I, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to questions about our loved ones, right? And I just, I had this experience in my life where I realized that my loved ones aren't just my family. Mm -hmm. Our loved ones go outside of our family, and it's everyone in the world. Absolutely. And um, so instead of compressing that into your blood, think outside that. And that's a, really that's a very good idea. Expand what? that and open it up, and it's amazing how your life will shift and your thinking will shift, and it, you'll get a higher vibration. Um, I think this is a great course. I know what you're saying. I was just trying to, what, what she's saying is to think outside the box. In other words, to, to, to pray for people to, uh, outside the bloodline. I know I was trying to make this, you know, for those, for those of us who have, who, who are dealing with the, you know, the bereavement of, of someone that we've known and loved. But you're, you're absolutely right. We're all, we should, um, there's a very simple prayer to pray for those souls who have no one to pray for them. And, you know, and George Ritchie said that when we uh, think of, of other people and we send light wherever, he said it touches that person and it's like throwing a rock into a pond. It continues to ripple outward. It's like uh, the good that we attempt to do in, in this world, he said, creates light in ways we can't even fathom, but you'll see it after you pass on. It's like that goodness continues to touch people we don't even know. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. So just our intentions, according to Dr. Ritchie, he said, I saw my intentions as clear as my deeds. They were things. So when they meant well, it uplifted the entirety of the universe. The secret of the golden flower said, when you meditate, you raise the vibrations of 10,000 souls. Someone came up to me at the, at the break, and they were, I may have not communicated it very well, she was asking about the body that we move into after uh, the transition. 
Uh, the point I was trying to make was that that transition is so, is so easy and it's so subtle that this, this physical body is a physical replica of, or it's a physical manifestation of the etheric form. And so, you know, there is an etheric body, there's an astral body, uh, and so when we move out of this realm, it's not like we're moving into some shadowy realm. If, if anything, we're moving into a greater reality and uh, it's just moving at a faster vibration. So the, the thing is the body that, that we see uh, here, you know, it's uh, in, the, in the initial stages, it looks just exactly like we do here. Again, it's like Casey said, everything here is a reflection or a shadow of what exists on, on the other side. Now, and someone asked me about uh, the nature of addictions and things like that and does that have an impact after the death transition? It can. Uh, I'll, I'll give two examples of this. When one of the realms that George Ritchie saw uh, of one of the lower realms, he said, I don't know where we were, but we were, whether it was Los Angeles or New York, but we were over this, um, this bar where there were all these soldiers and sailors that were getting absolutely drunk. And uh, he said, and all of them had like, this etheric or auric field, like he could see the color patterns emanating from them. We all have that. Some are tuned in to see it, some, some can't, but it's just, it's the energy body. And so he said, but when they would pass out, uh, he said there were like these souls that were kind of in the background that didn't have this light around them. And one of, when one of them would pass out, there would be like a break in the top of their auric field and one of them would swoop in. And when they, came back to consciousness, then they were like bounced out again. And so he's watching this happen. And I, I, I have a really good friend who's, you know, the most mellow, even tempered guy, unless he drinks gin. How many of you have known somebody who like, seems like they totally change if they drink a certain type of alcohol? How many again? I was asking George Ritchie about this. I said, uh, so, these people who had this experience of when they drink a certain type of alcohol and they seem to like totally change, are, are we dealing with some form of possession here? He said, Robert, you know I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a University of Virginia professor, and I'm an MD. I said, yes. He goes, I'm a scientist. I said, yeah. He said, you know what I'm about to say, they're going to call me crazy. I said, yes. He goes, without question, we're dealing with a form of possession here, without question. The, the thing is, again, the desires that, that we have, and this is not true on, in all cases, but, you know, because there's a lot of us who can have a drink and not be affected, but there's certain people who, for whatever reason, are susceptible that um, if they drink a certain thing, that it opens them to this, not demonic possession, but that there's a, souls who have developed an addiction and again, I'm not speaking generally. I'm speaking about you know just certain cases, because uh, a lot of times we want one answer to the question, and there's not one answer. You know, for as many different people, there's going to be that many experiences. But the earthly desires that we have can, um, after we pass on, those desires are not physical things; they're of the mind. And so uh, George Ritchie said, "What if, you know?" some of the hellish realms or the earthbound realms were of the mind, not a place, but not being able to fulfill a desire that you had. And so in some cases, some souls will attach themselves to someone who has an addiction. And Casey said, any addiction is in some ways a form of possession because it's like, it's completely out of the person's control. And on the other side of the coin, though, that uh, in, there's a wonderful book that I highly recommend that I wrote about in The Place We Call Home, and I believe they have it in the bookstore. It's called Testimony of Light. Uh, and how many of you have read Testimony of Light? A couple of, Bill has, I know. Uh, they, just the they just sold the last copy. Well, I, I talked about it at, at, at length in my own book because it correlated so much with what Casey had to say, for those of you who are not familiar with it, the book is about an Anglican nun 
uh, from England, and she, you know, was uh, a great mystic while, while she was living. She explored and, and wrote books called The Frontiers of Revelation, whatnot, and, uh, you know, she was a believer in, in all the things that we've talked about this weekend. So she was very close to Helen Greaves, and when she made her transition, uh, you know, they had this very close bond, and she said, when I get over there, I'll talk to you about the journey, and Testimony of Light is the story of Francis's journey to the other side. And from the moment she passed over, within three days, she started communicating. And she said that, she talked about the different work that she was doing in the different realms. And one of them, she would talk about different souls that were crossing over. And she said, today we've had a new arrival. And she said, in life he was a, uh, a renowned surgeon. Um, just, he helped so many people. And she said, but he became addicted to morphine. And she said, and this ended his life. Uh, what is beautiful about the story is, she, she said, he is in our care. Uh, and we are helping him because his self-esteem had gotten so low. You know, people who wrestle with any type of addiction, it, it affects your self-esteem, it affects everything. And she said, and to help him, uh, she said, we took him into, uh, she said, the best way I can describe it is like a movie theater. And she said, and we showed him all of the instances in his life of where as a result of his work as a surgeon, how many lives that he saved, how many people that he helped. And she said, and that which was the addiction for him, she said, is being purged, purged. And this, when I read that, I thought purgatory took on a whole new meaning. <laughs> purgatory is not a bad realm. And I, I recently, did they do away with that or did they do away with another one? Limbo, yeah, which I never understood. There is no limbo, you know. Uh, but purgatory is where the soul, it's kind of like a, a snake that sheds its skin, okay? It's like it's letting go of, of uh, the things of the earth, the desires and, and whatnot. And it's, it's not a painful process. It, it's, a, it's a place of letting go. And, but what I found so moving about Testimony of Light was the unconditional love and the lack of judgment of any kind. You know, she was looking at the light of this man's soul. You know, the fact that he was sensitive and he became addicted to a very addictive substance uh, had nothing to do with who he was. You know, as an individual, this addiction became as a possession for him. And even in that light that it ended his life, and I have no doubt that it was probably tragic, what is so beautiful is to read this book and see the, from the other side that not only was there help there, there was more help, he was freed, and then he went on to work with other medical professionals that were helping technologically to put through new things to help medicine here on Earth. Isn't that something? Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. And there was another story that she told that talked about, she said, I have been privileged to go with one of the other light beings that she, she called them to the more lower or earthbound realms. And she said, and what I saw there, she said, if I would say his name, you would know who I'm talking about. But she said, this was one of the Nazis, one that orchestrated the concentration camps. And she said, um, he is in like a place by himself and he's in sort of a half conscious place. And I don't know if you remember on Friday, I talked about the life review that we see through the eyes of people we've affected. Well, imagine him as he comes to waking consciousness that he's faced to ev everything that he caused surrounds him. Now, this is by his own doing. And so she said, because there are no prayers coming from earth for this soul, his progress is slow. This goes back to what you were saying earlier about we need, we need to think outside the box. 
And it's like, if we're not praying for our quote-unquote enemies, we're missing the mark. It's like, we again, to pray for those souls who have no one to pray for them. You know, um, what, I think it was Gandhi, uh, Jesus, all of them said, when you can look into the eye of the one that would even assassinate you and try to see God there, you've begun your spiritual work. This is why I think they call it the work, because we are reflections of each other. And so, you know, I saw in the readings when people would, would ask, like, how does the darkness operate, or how do, do the forces of dar darkness operate in this world? And he said, uh, and they were asking about the Antichrist forces, and he said, jealousy, envy, gossip, um, vengeance, uh, greed. He said, these are doorways through which the darkness can come in and take possession of individuals, groups, <coughs> nations. So it's through the human will. It's not, we needn't be afraid of something coming across the ocean and taking over. It's right where we sit by our choice, by our, by our choices. We have to choose to be prejudiced. We have to choose to be vengeful. We, and, it's, and this is what I meant when that lady asked me, when I responded and said, if you mean well, if you move from the heart, that's everything. It's everything. But for those souls that do seek vengeance and do seek things, and it's very easy to make assumptions on the looking from the outside in about a situation that we don't understand. And I've found, and I've mentioned this before, about it really helps if you look that each and every one of us is writing, producing, directing our own film. We're starring in our own movie. Uh, and in a very real way, we've become like one of those great actresses that totally immerses themselves in the character that we forgot we were acting. Meryl Streep comes to mind, right? Uh, that all of us are involved in each other's film and we exit the stage in many different ways, but nobody really dies. I mean, in the larger scope of things, you know, and looking at it from that viewpoint helps us not be so thinking that this is the be all and end all, because it's not. And, you know, and I think that that perspective uh, lessens the pain a bit. I mean, in India, in ancient times, uh, when a village was destroyed by a natural disaster where large, a large population would be annihilated, they would have a three-day celebration. Why? Because they got to go home. They didn't look at the way, that our, it's one of the reasons I got out of the news business, is because they focus so much on, on the disaster. And yes, we do need to be compassionate and help those who are involved in these things, but for those who pass on, you know, in, in India, they understood that the soul made its transition, you know, and they got to leave early. I mean, this, is, this was well documented that they understood that. Yes? Um, while I, uh, I'm a firm believer that there are really no mistakes in any of this, I often have wondered about that, the passing on of such things as the choice to be prejudiced. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, vengeful, because it, it seems that there are <coughs> groups that will train their children from infancy to... Yes, you know, you, you I was going to... Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does a child coming into that uh, choose to... And see, I, her, her, her question is about those people that train, uh, and George Ritchie talked about uh, the nature of prejudice, that you have to be, children uh, by nature are not prejudiced. They're taught. Prejudice, you have to be taught to hate this person or that person or whatnot. I mean, I came from a very small town in rural Indiana, and I have a whole different view of white picket fence America, and it's not pleasant at all. <laughs> not at all. I mean, I would never move back to the Midwest. My parents didn't think like this. But the town did. I mean, they were very racially prejudiced. They had been cultivated for centuries. And the thing is, I, I am so glad that I, uh, 
that the magic of God, I call it, dropped George Ritchie's book in my lap because he saw the realm of the prejudiced. He said, if I had any prejudices in my life, he said, I can tell you, and he didn't, he said, but I can tell you they were gone from what I saw. Let's say you had uh, a white person who, who hated blacks or a black person who hated whites or uh, somebody who hated somebody because of their religious orientation or their sexual orientation, whatever it is. I'm talking about a carefully cultivated hatred. Okay, They were face to face with the person, the group that they hated. They were face to face with them, like with the same people who despised them. And he said it was a realm of abject chaos. They were all trying to kill each other, but because their bodies were, you know, they didn't have substantial bodies, they couldn't inflict any harm. And that made them more enraged. And he said, but, and he said, this realm was breaking the heart of the Christ himself. He said, because they had forgotten love was, you know, they, they had forgotten love. And yet, even here, even in that, that, that low place or a, a place of low vibration of ignorance, because all things like this, we're, we're dealing with ignorance. He said, you would see out of this group that right above them were their guardian angels, their guides, and they were waiting to hear something. What do you think that was? Help. And as soon as they did, then they were led to the next stage so they could understand and let go of this. But, uh, you know, the, this, there are consequences to this. And it's not... God hasn't willed that any of this happen, but because we've been given free will and a mind, uh, we can create absolute harmony. We can create absolute chaos. You know, it's, it always amazes me when people say, you know, when something absolutely wonderful happens, you don't hear say, I'm so glad God allowed this to happen. You only hear it when something bad happens. And they say, why would God allow something like this to happen? Am I right? Yeah. It's like, God is love. Love is God. And it's like, and the more that we just simply move from that place, the greater light that is shed not only in this realm, but in realms unseen. Uh, I saw one of Casey's readings. Some of you may have heard this, this story before, but this will illustrate to you how powerful we truly are. A group of people were working on doing laying on of hands healing, guided by the readings of Edgar Cayce. He was giving readings on how to do spiritual healing, how to be channels of healing for others. And they're working with this lady, and she was getting better. And then one afternoon, she died. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being the channel? You know, healing, light, whatever, and you go and check on her. And immediately, because we're so used to taking things personally, I can hear the group after they get the news about this. Oh gosh, I had a fight with my mother-in-law that day. I shouldn't have touched her. I probably did her in. No, no, I had a ham sandwich. That probably killed her. No, it didn't have, I mean, you know, I can hear all these things. And when they got the reading, when they asked about, you know, this experience, and I don't remember the exact phrasing, but Casey said, as we find the group is dealing too much in appearances for death, is a healing sometimes. He said, you grieve for her, and yet she walks now with the master whom she loved, whom she served. So their laying on of hands healing enabled her to have a peaceful, light-filled transition to the other side. But what were they thinking the day before? I killed her. I know it was me. It had to be me. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's our natural insecurity. And so... Death is a healing sometimes. It, it really is. And so this is why some of the most enigmatic questions, some of the most, you know, the questions that, that we'd love to have answers to, there is no one answer to. It's like the gentleman said earlier that the readings that Casey gave were for in, each individual. And what applied to that person doesn't always apply generally. It's like when people ask about suicide. Well, that's a big subject. 
And there's a big difference between someone who kills themselves thinking that they can get out of life circumstances and someone who is in an immense or great deal of pain or is, has a uh, mental illness to where everything they see around them has turned into a nightmare and they want the horror to end. Vast difference. And we need to be very careful of the assumptions that, that we make because uh, there isn't one answer. It's a very complex thing. And just as there's not one place where we all live, on the other side there's many mansions, many different realms that the soul passes to. And, and to say, well, all people go to an earthbound state who commit suicide is really limiting things. If, if anything, we need to pray for those who have uh, passed on that way, you know, because they need our prayers. And by the same token, just from my own personal experience, I know that this is, you know, somewhat controversial, but just in my own life, um, it's very tempting for me to look at certain situations and go, what are the karmic implications? And it's like, I have completely stopped doing that because I don't know what's going on behind the scenes in anybody's life but my own. And my great uncle Charlie, and I was in Wilmington last week and I, I told this story. Um, he had had a stroke and he could only move his eyes, just completely paralyzed, and he could think. At family gatherings, tears would just stream down his, his face. He was just completely, you know. Um, a vegetable, except he could think and he could move his eyes. But, and my great Aunt Emma was the one who took care of him for, I think, 10 years like that. She would not put him in a home. Um, and my grandmother, who had about a fifth grade education, I remember her telling me the story about Charlie and the doctor came and made a house call, you know, and this was back in the days when they did that in rural Indiana. And she talked about this like, this is just what you do in circumstances like this. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just sharing from my own personal experience. My Aunt Emma said, Doc, can you do something to help Charlie? And she's sitting on his bed, and he's, Charlie's looking at the doctor, and tears are streaming down his face, and the doc says, help Charlie? She says, yeah, Doc, help Charlie. And he says, Charlie? And he could blink once for yes, twice for no. Is this what you want? Charlie blinked once for yes, and he prepared something, a hypodermic, and Charlie went peacefully, and the doctor filled out the death certificate and said, death by natural causes. Now, my Aunt Emma was at peace with this, Charlie was at peace with it, the family was at peace with it, everybody was at peace with this. Because of that, I can't go there as far as was this right, wrong, whatever, and I think I can just feel, you know, the love of the divine going, everybody's at peace, everybody's comfortable, everybody loved Charlie, they wanted him to be comfortable and happy, and that the doctor was willing to assist, who am I to judge? You know, these are the things that call into place our judgments of what we think about things. And the thing is, we can't make assumptions unless we're in it. And because I knew Charlie and my grandmother, uh, and this was a part of my family, my grandmother said, this is just something that you did. We treat our animals better than people. We have become a community that treats animals better than people. There was a time when... Doctors, made, this was why they made house calls. Because they knew when it was time to help somebody let go. Now, I, I'm not saying this is brought, uh, applicable to, to all cases. I'm just saying that before the legal system got involved, this is what they did. And so I was talking with Bill at the, at the break, and, and he was saying what I said, it's a big question about the nature of suicide, and there isn't one answer. There isn't one uh, experience or place or whatnot that someone goes to. There is a wonderful <clears throat> book uh, by Richard Matheson called What Dreams May Come. Not the film, the book. 
Now, uh, in that book, um, there's a woman who, after her, her husband passes on, she commits suicide. Now, in the book, she left her three children behind um, because she missed her husband, and she thought death would end everything. Now, uh, keep in mind, this is, this is one single situation that Richard Matheson wrote in a novel beautifully, uh, but he talked about the love of her husband who had gone on to the Summerland, to paradise. He knows of what, what has happened, and he wants to go help her because she's, the way that his guide explained it in the story was because it wasn't her time to go, it was like she was kind of between places and she didn't know that she was dead because she didn't believe in any, anything came afterward. So she was kind of in a somewhat of a state of confusion. And the story has a beautiful ending in that nothing is permanent. And in the what they left out of the film was, and again, this is not always true either. This is just for, for this one case. He said uh, that because her normal lifespan would have been, you know, given the circumstances of where she was then, she was going to live another 24 years. So he said, so she was going to have to remain in that state for 24 years till her life would have naturally ended. So she was kind of in time, but unable to really do anything about it. And then she would be able to move on. But it's kind of like when they, they ask in the readings, like, why is suicide considered wrong? Uh, and Casey said something about a selfish suicide, meaning irrespective of and not thinking of anybody else, someone of a rational mind thinks that they can just go on. What happens is they have forgotten all the people who love them. You know, they've forgotten that, that, uh, that bond of love. And that's what Casey said, We're, no person is an island. We don't live to ourselves or die to ourselves. And, and he said, so it has to do a great deal with the people that, that we're connected with. And so, and this is why it's always a different set of circumstances in, in cases like of my Uncle Charlie, as opposed to someone who wants to get out of life's situations, people who had near-death experiences as a result of suicide, they realize that everything that they were trying to get away from was waiting for them on the other side, that there was no getting away from anything, that, you know, we, we move through things. And so... I don't know, I can picture some life where I'm sure that I probably did commit suicide in the past because the feeling I have is standing outside a closed stage door where a play is going on and I walked off stage and I'm aware, first of all, oh my God, there were other supporting cast members on, in the play with me. There was an audience I wasn't aware of and I'm trying to get back in the door. And somebody comes up to me and goes, one rule, you don't ever walk off stage. And I'm going, oh my God. I mean, that is just an illustration of like, I suddenly became aware of people had waited a year to come see this play. So people, and the other cast members who were depending on me, the play fell apart because I wasn't there. And I mean, I don't know when that happened, but I can just remember it, and there was a great deal of compassion and sadness from this person who walked up to me and said, honey, you don't ever walk off stage, and you did. I said, what do I do now? Come with me. I don't remember anything after that, but, um, but here I am, so uh, there's, <laughs> there's, always, there's always hope. There's always light. And so in our families, regardless of the circumstances, the prayer that we have, and for the world at large, you know, re realize we're, what happens to other people on the other side of the world, you know, is, is our concern as well. And if, if we can do nothing else, send light, send prayer to them. It, it uplifts everything, absolutely everything. And so when we meditate, it's not to have an experience, but it's to tune in to the divine and the vibrations that go out from us lift Everything, absolutely everything. And so I'm going to lead you through a meditation in uh, a little bit, but we've, I have a few minutes for questions.
questions? Yes. Are you familiar with the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and are, do you know if Casey ever spoke about it in any of the readings? The, uh, he asked if um, I was familiar with the Tibetan Book of the Dead. He talked about the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And I know that there are some refer <clears throat> references to it, but I'm not quite familiar with it. I will. Are you familiar with the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying? Yes. Isn't that wonderful? This book uh, was written by uh, Sogyal Rinpoche, and it was written for Westerners. Because, and it's got a foreword by the Dalai Lama. And the meditation that I'm going to use is the poa. It's, um, uh, it's to help raise the vibrations for those that have passed on and also our own because in, in the Buddhist belief they, they think of things as everything we do is in preparation for the next stage of life and so they have these meditations prayers in here to help others and to help ourselves do what they call die a peaceful happy death and I know that training the mind has a great deal to do with going through that because my grandmother, um, my maternal grandmother, her husband had a very, very um, painful death as a result of rheumatic fever. And uh, she used to say, I just want to go in my sleep. I just want to go in my sleep. I, you know, I'm not. And guess what happened? She went in her sleep. She had, I mean, she had had some heart problems a few years earlier, but she was active and whatnot, and when she went to bed, you know, there, she was not sick, she left. So we can train the mind and the spirit to where we, it doesn't have to be. Anyway, this, this book I highly recommend if you're interested in exploring deeper some of the dimensions of, of the afterlife, uh, I highly recommend this book. Yes? Yes, I have two quick questions. One, in light of what you said about when the soul inhabits the body. Um, when the soul inhabits the body. Thing about abortion. And the other question is, what is the difference between the collective unconscious and the collective subconscious? Those are two very, her, her questions were, those are big questions. Um, <laughs> in, in, na in relation to what I said about the soul entering the body, the implications as far as abortion goes, I'll, I'll take that one first. And again, uh, drawing from the readings, Casey said, souls are drawn to open avenues of expression into the earth. Okay, that decision to become part of a family is made long, long before conception ever happens. It's like souls, it's, it's very intricate. It's, and since there's no time and space, really, we're kind of choosing our parents now for our next life. And so if a woman has made the decision or if the parents have made the decision to terminate the pregnancy, no soul is going to be attracted to them. Just, it's not going to happen. As Casey said, they're drawn to open avenues of expression into the earth. That doesn't represent an open avenue if they've made that decision. And so I don't think it's a moral question. I think it's, a, it's you know, it's bigger than that. And, you know, there are circumstances, well, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. The soul enters after, at first breath or sometime after. Now, the body has a consciousness. The body has an awareness. Like, <clears throat> they used to say that whenever an elderly person would go into what's known as the second childhood, in cases of Alzheimer's or uh, uh, senile dementia or whatnot, um, they, and this is in The Boy Who Saw True also, because he was looking and he was able to see auras and he looked at his Aunt Maud and he said, there's something funny with the old thing's lights. I can't quite figure it out. He didn't know the word auras, so he said, there's something funny with the old thing's lights. And he said, I had the feeling there wasn't a soul there. And the man who edited these diaries, uh, because the man only allowed these to be published uh, after his death and anonymously, I do not know who he was, but he was incredibly gifted. Uh, he said, the idea of a body without a soul is not as strange as it, as it may sound. He said, uh, there are many times where when the, when the person goes into the second childhood, the soul has already moved on, and then the body is, uh, it's the so-called body elemental. And it has the mentality of about a two or three-year-old. So 
again, we're multidimensional beings. I don't know why that there's this long period, you know, between the separation, but a lot of times when that happens, it's just the body consciousness. And my own, uh, my paternal grandmother, she was in like this catatonic state for like 10 years and uh, before she passed. And, you know, I wrote about this in my book, Universe of Worlds, because, you know, it was one day she was there and the next day she wasn't. She was physically there, but you could look into her eyes and see that something had happened. And it wasn't Alzheimer's because it was very rapid. Ten years she lived in this state. There's a friend of mine who was a medium, and we were at dinner, and she said, I'm seeing a lady, gray hair, and we can change our appearance so people can recognize us on the other side. And she said, I'm seeing this woman, gray hair, glasses, she's got a very large mole right here and calls you Robbie. I said, that's my grandma Hazel. <laughs> Hazel was the one who, for 10 years, had existed in this comatose state. And, and my friend Michelle didn't know anything about my grandmother, and she said, your grandmother wants me to tell you that not to feel bad about, those, uh, about not seeing her in the nursing home. Uh, she said, I didn't spend a day there. <laughs> I didn't spend a day there. And I asked Michelle if I could ask her a question, and she said, yes. And the soul had already left. Yeah. And when I asked her why was there such a long period between the separation of the body, you know, and, or the death of the body and her consciousness, she said, I provided those nurses with a very nice living. <laughs> Honest to God. I, isn't that something? I mean... To us, I mean, it's so serious, and it's so this, and my grandmother's going, ah, you know, I provided those nurses with a nice living. Who knows? I mean, again, the, there's so many different things, but what a reassurance. And she came because my, my aunt, uh, who had had a rather turbulent relationship with my grandmother, she would, she would always go in, and see her and sit with her and whatnot, and my grandmother was very un unresponsive except for one time it was like she seemed to come back fully into herself. Her eyes, you know, took on Hazel again. And she looked at Myra and she said, why don't you just leave? Oh, I know, I know, same feeling you had. But in reflecting on this experience, when she communicated, when my friend Michelle gave me this message, she wanted me to tell the family what had happened, you know, she was only able to probably say a few words or to get that, that through. What she was saying to my aunt was, honey, I'm not here. You know, uh, move on. And, and, and again, this is an individual situation. I'm not saying we shouldn't go and visit our <laughs> loved ones. That's not what I mean. But she was just trying to tell her, I've already gone. I've already gone on. Yes? How do we pray for the dead? How do we pray for the dead? Um, Casey gave a, a prayer. It's, uh, I mean, you can pray any, any way you want in, in the form of talking to them, but just uh, there was a prayer where he said, let me write it. If you'd like to write it down, you can. I'm trying to remember what reading number it was in, and I, it's not quite here, but I do remember the prayer. And you can use this if you want, but again, in just... Uh, Everybody has their own unique way of, of praying, but his was, Father, in, and this is, oh, it's in the 281 series, I think 281, 16, I think, I don't know, you can check that, thank you, by the way, um, Father, in, in thy love, And Casey often spoke in a sort of a biblical way. I mean, I know some of the readings are hard to understand, but this was in response to the question, uh, give us a prayer to help those who pass on. So he said, Father, in thy love, in thy mercy, in thy love, in thy mercy, be, be thou near, and the, the person's name, be thou near, 
who has recently has recently entered the borderland. The borderland. The borderland is, you know, like a way station right right between this world and the next, or the summer land. Uh, entered the entered the borderland. And he said, may I, oops, sorry about that, may, may I aid, or may I help, um, may I aid, um, Father, in thy love and thy mercy, be thou near, and then the name of the person who has recently entered the borderland. May I aid when, he actually said, when you see that you can use me. So basically it's saying, what the, when you say this prayer, Father, in thy love and thy mercy, be thou near, this person who has, who has recently entered the borderland. May I aid when you can use me. I paraphrase the last uh, sentence because the original was, may I aid when thou seest that thou canst use me, and I can't spell that out. <laughs> so, um, but again, that was, that was in, in answer to this. And so what this says is, I saw readings where Casey said, in the dream state, we're often helping uh, other souls, like this one woman was told in a reading that while she was asleep, she was helping soldiers that were killed on the battlefield, she was acting in the capacity of a guardian angel, helping them to the light in her sleep state. She had no memory of this whatsoever, no conscious memory. So uh, we're about a whole different work when we're in the sleep state, and you have to get to a certain level of consciousness before our journeys through the astral realm imprint themselves on the, on the conscious mind. So when you say this prayer, it's like, uh, and again, in, you can use this or work with this for, you know, if you're concerned about someone who has passed on, again, you can create a statement before you go to sleep, you know, that not to hold them back and not for curiosity's sake, but that if you feel that there's some unfinished business, and I was, I, I can't remember whether I mentioned this on Friday or not, but I'm reminded of the story that Raymond, Raymond Moody told of this woman who could not remember what her son looked like before he got leukemia and passed away. She said the image of what he looked like before he died just was imprinted upon her mind. And they worked together and she had a dream experience where not only did she dream of him, she woke up in the middle of the night and saw him looking vibrant and healthy and he hugged her and that image was completely gone. And I know that, you know, for those reasons, for a greater reason, you can write down on, on a piece of paper. What you write down before you go to sleep is like a letter to your, uh, to God, to your higher self. And so, simply a statement of, if it's in keeping with divine will, may I communicate with, and you write their name. The reason I say, if it's in keeping with divine will, that means it won't interfere with their work or of, of what they're doing. And what will happen is, you know, if they're busy, like I said earlier, those who've passed on, they have their moods just like we do. So they don't always want to communicate at the time that we want them to. But the avenue of dreams is a definite avenue through which we can commune with those who have passed on with angels or whatnot. So if you feel that there's something that's left undone or unsaid, this is a great avenue to bring about healing. And um, I know that I was working with a, a close friend who had passed suddenly, and we had had an argument, uh, harsh words, and I was left with this guilt, you know, and so I asked for a dream, you know, so that I could uh, ask for forgiveness, feel better about the situation and not hinder his development. And in the dream, instead of him showing up, 
there was a UPS guy or a FedEx truck that handed me this envelope with a note from him that said, all is well, I'm fine. You know, and I remember, and I, when I wrote that dream down, I was like, FedEx truck, UP, what, what, what is that? And I thought, oh, messenger service. Angels are messengers. And I thought it, come, it came in a way for me to understand because I'm going, why the FedEx guy? And it's like, <laughs> and he was saying that all was well. When I woke up, I was, felt completely like everything was okay. So, yes? You speak of different realms. What if uh, grandma's at the throne singing and granddad's counting his money? Do they even know each other there? And how do they know to come and help me when it's my time to cross over? Uh, <laughs> good question. His, his, his question is if, gra if, if uh, and you're talking worst case scenario, if, if grandma's singing around a throne and uh, grandpa's counting his money, how can they be there to help me? Um, they'll send somebody. <laughs> Rest assured, they will send somebody. And again, for the most part, these are tri the time that she's singing around the throne or he's counting his money is like a day in the scheme of things. It's, it's momentary. And, and, and these are transitional <laughs> phases, and usually there's always someone who comes in and goes, Psst, hey, there's something better over here, and then they open the door. So, yes? You said if you um, get up there, if you're moving down here, you're going to be moving up there. No, no, I said the, those on the other side have their moods. Have their moods. Yeah. What, all right, well, still I want to know. If you are <laughs> mentally ill down here, are you mentally ill when you cross over? I, I, her, her question is, if you're mentally ill here, are you mentally ill on the like other side? Schizophrenic or bipolar or something like that. If you're schizophrenic or bipolar, uh, that deals, I don't think so. Her, her, her question is, um, if you're mentally ill here, are you mentally ill on, on the other side? It doesn't make sense that you would be. I saw readings where Casey said, that because of an injury to the spine, that the nervous system was getting short-circuited. In a lot of cases of mental illness, it was a physical thing. And so having left the body behind, um, and again, there are those guides, those people that are there to help us. And it's like I've said before, just as we have a team of doctors and nurses who help us into this world, there's a group that helps us over. So I really believe that.